Back to Hello Nigeria. We're here now to discuss mental health, the journey to joy. Now, seated with us is a lawyer, a media entrepreneur, and someone who is an all-round creative. Mm -hmm. Now, he's only not only the founder of Joy Inc., he's a co-founder of the Future Project, the co-author of How to Win Elections in Africa, and also a man on a mission of transforming Sub-Saharan Africa into a mental, emotional, and spiritual safe place. We are speaking with Chude Gideon. Well, thank you very much for thank joining you for us. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank you. Somebody said the one and only Chude. I'm like, I like that. The one, <laughs> the one and the one only Chude. The one and only. Chude <laughs> Iti. Good to have you. Same here. How, is, how does it feel to be back home? That's good. It's good. It's good. I love home. All of informed like me home. that the last time you were on the show was yeah. actually exactly a year ago. On yes. the 4th of July last year, so yes. a year and a day. <laughs> yes, I actually forgot. Exactly. We came to talk about um, the impact of, of Hillary the, and yes, Trump winning yes, and what do you yes, have in Nigeria. Yes, yes, yes. So now I, I introduced you as the founder of Joy Inc. And yeah. lately you've been all about joy on your yes. Instagram pages. Yeah. You know, you, you do the daily vulnerables where yes. you, you basically allow people be themselves, express yeah. themselves, their vulnerabilities. Yeah. And you started by expressing your vulnerabilities. But yeah. what led you to the journey of joy? Ah, it's a long story. Um, um, do we have three hours? <laughs> <laughs> um, but primarily it's that um, I've dealt with depression over and over, um, over the past, what, 10 years. I think I had my first bout of depression in law school um, in 2008, I think. Um, and you know just how you keep having these experiences and you assume that it's normal because you have a lot of people around you who feel the same way and you think that unha unhappiness is the default yeah and you also think that it's a natural consequence of 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 of, ach of of achievement or of the kind of hard work that that leads to achievement so you think look I have no choice happiness is something that people only talk about in songs you know I have to just like we say hustle and do this thing um, and then I had so on and off depressions, mostly situational depression, on and off. Um, in in 2016, I had a big bout of depression. A lot of things were happening at the same time. There was disappointment with the state of the nation. There was my own personal health issues. There was personal financial issues. Just all these things come together that kind of dislocated my self image of myself, which is my image of myself, which is really what happens with depression. And um, and I, I, I had thoughts of suicide once, you know, and I, I saw a therapist and I got put on drugs and all of that. And so, and just before then, I had already decided to myself that this was not a sustainable way to live, that there had to be a better way to live. And I'd begun on social media and, 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 uh, in January, I think, of 2015, I had said I was beginning a journey towards joy. And the hashtag was only joy, no more fear. And so as I was trying, to, getting on this journey, getting better, then this big bang depression, like I call it, hits me, you know, and put me on the floor. Um, but then there's a researcher uh, at, um, um, I think, um, NYU, Columbia University in the United States, who says depression is usually a knock on the door for a deeper spiritual experience, if you allow it. And so what happened was my depression forced me to kind of accelerate my own journey into myself. And by the time I came out, not only had I discovered more about myself, but I also discovered a lot about depression and unhappiness and a lot of the latest thinking and research across the world. And I thought to myself, how come I didn't know these before now? And how come so many people don't know these readily available statistics? And I also began to realize that depression was an oncoming epidemic that we were completely un un unready for. Uh, as a society, you know, or even as a civilization, so to speak. And so I thought, okay, somebody needs to tell the story. You know, somebody needs to tell people to watch out for these crises and to tell them a better story about how to handle this crisis when it eventually arrives. Now, Chude, you said that you've battled with depression on and off for the past 10 years. Yes. And if we take it like waves going yes. in and out and in and out, yes. what would you say you do to stop yourself from falling back into depression? Mm. And what often leads you as well to fall mm. back into depression when you do? Well, so if for a long time, for the first seven years of that, I wasn't doing anything but just going on, which is what you do as a Nigerian. You just you just like, I don't have time for this. This is a useless emotion. This is all in my head, which is true. I always tell people, it is all in your head, but that doesn't mean it is any less true because love is all in your head as well. Like, you didn't go to the market and buy love, but you feel it for your child. And so even though it's all in your head, it still means something significant, yeah? So for the first seven years, I didn't do anything. I didn't think I should do anything because, again, I wasn't clinically depressed for those first seven years. It was something you call... I mean, I'm sure if I had seen some kind of therapist, I would have found that I was sleeping on the edges of clinical depression. But I always managed to just come out of it. So it was essentially situational. Something would happen to make me 
it is and I could function as a human being. It wasn't until 2015 that I saw a therapist for the first time. Yeah? And I always like to say to people that there's a therapist from the Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital, Yaba, so that we can throw that stigma on the floor and let's get down to the business of making this thing happen. And it was the first time, and, and you know, I mean, we had, we had a limited set of sessions because she already said I was on my own journey. I she didn't think I needed to do a full, long-term bouquet of sessions. Um, so that's when I began to really deal with this. And the way that I dealed, dealt with this was, I know this sounds a bit um, hokey, but was to find myself, you know? And again, for people who are dealing with, especially um, 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 major depressive episodes, who are having to take drugs, it might be a bit insulting to them. They might say, you're making it sound like there's something wrong with me. That I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there are people for whom this can be a call to a deeper experience of themselves. And I happen to have been one of those kinds of people. And I found out that my life was essentially misaligned, you know, in terms of the things that I was trying to do, in terms of the way I was trying to do them, and in terms of the kind of person I was. You know, when there's a dissonance, I think, between yourselves, your inner self and your outer self, then something begins to happen there. And so that was the first thing I kind of tried to sort out. However, more urgently, one of the things that deeply helped me was meditation. Yeah, and in my own case it was prayer, meditative prayer. So I've been a Christian for a long time. But then my own prayer has always been 15 minutes, you know, God, it's a laundry list, this, that, this. As I go out today, guide and protect me and my family. You can do what you like with the other shah. <laughs> my family. <laughs> Did this and I began to find out, and it was remarkable because when I when I came out of my depression and I was reading, I began to find out that in terms of building your immunity against depression, meditation is one of the most important, multiply validated by research tools for building internal happiness. And I didn't know this when I stepped in because my prayer, my prayer life, as Christians call it, accelerated by almost 500%. Because when you're in depression, you have nowhere to turn. So you are just like, God, what is happening? What is happening to me? And, you know, the more I read, the more I prayed, the more I discovered. And, you know, that's, in my own case, that's what brought me out of depression. But that's not what happens for a lot of other people. A lot of people do other things. Some people do non-spiritual meditation, yeah? And so in my own case. But what I find is, I often say that depression is a disease of perspective. And so, and that doesn't, it, again, that doesn't reduce its effects and its status as a sickness, as a disease. It's a disease, but it's of perspective. Now, when, and, and again, this is, we can't go into detail in the show, and also I'm, also I'm not a psychologist, even though I have a board of psychologists for joy in, but these thought processes have chemical um, um, components to them. But the things that, sh that, that, that move those chemicals are your thoughts and your behaviors and your etc, etc. And while if a person is facing a manic episode or a major depressive episode, then the person should see a psychiatrist or therapist. But if it is not an urgent matter, a person can begin to do, and that's what therapy is, a series of exercises that are internal or that are held by other people that can help shift the perspective. You know, and one of the most important things that leads to depression is when a person's sense of their place in the world is disconnected. When the person loses a relationship that's deeply important to the person, and the person cannot locate themselves in the world, and cannot look into the future and be excited about the future, that leads to it. So, so Chimamanda said a while ago in the Guardian that it is, depression is not just hopelessness; depression is helplessness. You feel like there is no reason to be, yeah. and so, and it's a matter of perspective because the objective, material, and otherwise world is still as it was before you fell into the depression. But it's the way that you interpret the world that has changed. And now, so, let's speaking about perspectives. Yeah. Let's look yeah. at some of the perspectives we need to break down. There's right. some myths and stigma right. that is surrounding depression. I like the yes. fact that you mentioned that yeah. it was someone from the psychiatric yes. ward yes. that you had to see. But yes. there's still some stigma yes. associated with depression. What yes. are these things that we need to bring down? We're a society of stigma. We love stigma. You know, you know one of the things, I was watching a Nollywood movie. I do a lot of Nollywood movie watching. And somebody who died in the film. Uh, I think it was Bola Lili Nelowo or someone. And, her mother, and people were like, no, somebody was dying. People were like, don't die. Would you want to punish your mother? I'm like, no, it's not her fault. Like, the dying, she didn't do anything wrong. Like, you know, but we, as a society, we believe in stigma and blackmail because we don't want to do the hard work of mentally and emotionally engaging situations. And so, so there's HIV with stigmatized. There's Ebola with stigmatized. Whatever it is, we just go straight to stigma. So, 
To be honest, the stigma issue with depression, we still stigmatize HIV positive people fundamentally. The problem with stigma is a societal problem that requires a deeper issue. And part of me talking about my depression openly, even though I haven't gone through any episodes now in two years plus, and part of me talking about visiting the psychiatric hospital and seeing a therapist, and all those things that men are not supposed to do, is deliberately... And women as well. And women, yes. Deliberately to attack the stigma at its roots, yeah? But also, um, and, so, and that's what we need to do. We just need to... The, the, only, the only solution to stigma is to normalize difference. Fantastic. Absolutely. So the only solution to stigma yes. is to normalize difference. Yes. You know, That's so, fantastic. As human beings, we have an unhealthy addiction to normal. And routine. Yes. When we think that something is out of the normal, it's abnormal means to us it must be shut down. And so when somebody has a sickness we don't understand, that's not a use, it's not a sickness that we, we have done a meeting to agree that is a Nigerian sickness, then we stigmatize anybody that does that. And sometimes it's fear. It's almost as if... Because we have so many problems as a nation, we feel like if we acknowledge that somebody can f collapse under the weight of that problem, then somehow we are admitting that even we can collapse under the weight of that yeah. problem. So it's better to deny this problem. But it's completely useless. And that is why we have this untreated depression crisis. Absolutely. And let's actually take a look at the future of mental health in Nigeria right. because depression crisis may be a great way to describe this. Yeah. The 2018 budget, now yeah. we'll look into the health budget, yeah. and there is under a 4% allocation to health, if I'm yes. correct, yeah. and I don't have the statistics for mental health yes. in that health budget, yes. but what does this say for the future of mental health in Nigeria? I think the more alarming problem, and first, um, I've done a lot of things with government um, in the past, in my, like I said, my past life, and... Um, because I, I haven't yet had conversations, I was supposed to sit with this special assistant to the Minister of Health. He has a special assistant on mental health, and so that's a significant thing, but I haven't just found the time to sit, sadly. So I, I can't speak specifically to that, but I know that we have a crisis because the national mental health policy we have was made in 1990. So that is uh, uh, 28 years old. It was updated slightly, I think, in 2005, but it wasn't overhauled. It was updated. The, we only have, uh, 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 the, the statistics we have for depression numbers in the country, which came to 3%, which is a sizable number of about 7 million people, which is con seriously conservative. It was done by Professor Oyo Gureje in, in, uh, in the University of Ibadan. And these were not government-enabled research projects. They were not government-supported research projects. So government doesn't have its own data as far as we know and we have searched on the exact nature of the mental health crisis that we have, which includes other things on the spectrum of mental health, bipolar disorders and all of that, not talk of depression, which is usually the more common mental health disorder that we have. So cumulatively, we don't have a systemically efficient response to depression as a crisis. And because depression, I often say, and this is me, this is not something that, that the research says, but I'm a storyteller, so my job is to tell a story based on the available data, is that depression is contagious. <laughs> if you live in a house with a mother that is depressed, even if it's situational, you are more likely to catch it unless you have your immunity. I think I totally agree with you in a certain way because yeah. this even leads me to the next question I was yeah. going to ask you. Yeah. There's something called vicarious trauma. Right. And we find that you are in a country like Nigeria and things are not going well. You're yes. seeing people dying yes. on, with, by the numbers. Yes. And you can feel that overwhelming yes. sense of sadness just seeing yes. that. We've seen people that yes. are going to protest in Abuja on Wednesday. Enough yes. is enough Nigeria. We're seeing yes. protests on social media. Yes. Hashtag blood on the flag. Yes. I personally know that two Mondays ago, mm -hmm. I woke up with an overwhelming yes. sense of sadness and I yes. just started crying. Yes. How are we able to sustain our joy mm. in the midst of all the madness? We're not. We're not. Nigeria is, again, this is not a, a data-driven. This is my own summation. Nigeria is a country of post-traumatic post -traumatic stress syndrome sufferers. First of all, we have a hidden rape epidemic that is incredible to think about. And somebody's trying to map out the actual data, but just the anecdotal evidence of sexual abuse, especially by fathers and brothers in Nigeria. And we have women who have internalized and dismissed this trauma because there's no way to deal with it. We have poverty as trauma. Poverty is its own unique trauma. Um, corruption as trauma. So we have all these traumas that we see 
that creates a sense that Nigeria is hopeless in and of itself. And there is no doubt that national traumas affect people on a personal level. There's no doubt about that. Um, I mean, we've talked a lot about the Biafran war trauma. We've not talked a lot about the after Boko Haram currently running trauma. We've not talked about all kinds of traumas. I mean, look at the outpouring of Southwest relief, just because uh, Abiola was suddenly posthumously. People didn't know that they were deeply affected by this kind of extended theft of a mandate. And so we have all of those things. And there is no doubt that those things weigh on the consciousness of our people. There's no doubt about that. Um, and again, on the societal level, we are not dealing with those. Uh, so somewhere in between the network of our synapses and you know, ETC, this must be combining into, again, I'm very deeply suspicious, deeply suspicious of the 3% uh, figures that we have for depression in Nigeria. First of all, there are 2005 or 2015 numbers, so seriously out of date also because in 2014, the World Health Organization predicted that depression would be the leading cause of disability worldwide by 2020, and it came in three years earlier. So it's already the leading cause. And in between that time when this epidemic compounded, we've not had new data for Nigeria. And that period of time, we've had more traumas, more people falling down the poverty line, you know, and all of those, a bigger breakdown yeah. of law and order in terms of people being able to get help after traumatic incidents. So, of course, just thinking about this, even without looking at any hard data, we must have a worse depression crisis. And oh. our population is exploding. Without, we only have one psychiatrist to 500,000 people. So this is a crisis all over the place. So yes. Let me actually tell you fine. why that has to be a very accurate statement. Right. If 7 million Nigerian youths today are addicted to drugs, which mm. is what the statistics say, Absolutely. and we know that one of the leading causes of drug abuse is depression, then that alone is the 3% yes. we're looking at yes. here. Yes. And yes. what we constantly see is the criminalization of people who are victims yes. of abuse in different ways. Yes. And one thing that's yes. criminalized is suicide. Meanwhile, yes. Nigeria is the 35th most suicidal nation yes. in the world. Yes. How does this correlate and yes. what do we need to do now to mm. ensure that this ends? You know, we often say that Joy Inc. is off, it can be seen as a media company, but and this is why I said I was going to do this, this um, uh, um, going to media platforms talk about this. Because we say Joy Inc. is a cultural transformation company, because what we really need to do is to transform the culture. We have a very violent culture in Nigeria, a lack of empathy, a lack of tolerance, a lack of compassion. Uh, I saw the video, and I'm sure you must have seen it, of that, on, I think, on Insta blog, where a young person was rescued from the bridge, tried to kill yes, himself, and, and they were treating him arrested. as if he was a thief. Yeah. I'm like, no, he didn't commit a crime, you know? Why do we think as a country that every time somebody is weak, we must punish the person for weakness? It's almost like when a soldier is shot on the battlefield, when we come, we punish the soldier for being shot on the battlefield rather than caring for the soldier. So as a culture, we have deep, a deep, lack of empathy, that is the primary problem that I think we need to solve. It's the reason why we don't have places for people to do, for people who have faced trauma. It's the reason why our police is the worst place to go to when you've lost your father or your mother, or you've just had a death in your family. It's, so that's a bigger problem. It's the reason why we hear people getting gunshot wounds and not getting treated. And not getting treatment, it's a bigger problem. So how are we going to make people start to come back to the question, start treating suicide victims as the victims that they are. And again, not every suicide victim is a depression victim. Some people are, have suicidal because they have sicknesses, you know, pain that they just can't cope with anymore and there's no facility for that. So it's for our culture to change, for us to have more empathy as a people, for us to see empathy as fundamental to the human existence. You know, loneliness is now a, a, a global epidemic. And people, found, people took it seriously this year when the UK appointed a minister for loneliness. Yeah. And that's because loneliness kills faster than taking 10 packs of cigarettes a day, or 10 sticks of cigarettes a day, I think. Loneliness is a worse killer than that. And so people, we need to stop treating diseases of the mind as diseases of weakness. All diseases are equal. If it's a disease, then people can get it. If they can get it, and it's not because there's anything fundamentally wrong with them, it's because human beings get diseases. And families and friends need to stop telling people to toughen up when people need to express their emotions. Expressing their emotions, crying, you know, when a person loses their, when I lost my father many years ago, say, man up, 
And I used to be annoyed. What does man not mean? Tears are part of what it means to be a human being. And so we need, and it's part of what we're trying to do, I'm trying to do, God help me, to change this, to, to make people begin to think differently about the kind of life we are living and begin to show more compassion to themselves I totally agree So that they can you. begin to show more compassion to others. It's even in the little things. Your child goes to school. Yes. Like we had a conversation some days ago with yeah. um, Ilemo Naonoja, and he talked about yeah. how little boys go to school, they come yeah. back second, yeah. and the girl is first, and they're saying, why should the why girl should be the girl first, be first after you? you? Which These is are the cultural changes we need yes. to see a shift. And I yes. was applaud you for the effort you're making. Mm. You know, We know that you partnered with She Writes Woman. So, so I want to, yes, I want to emphasize that Joy Inc. is essentially a storytelling company. The people that do the actual work are these mental health NGOs. And She Writes Women and Mentally Aware are two of them. And we give, we are just build, we're building a hub for them because we're raising money. So for your just, birthday, that was all you wanted that, for your yes. birthday. So, so we're doing that. We've gotten the space. Thanks. My co-founder, Debola, made a big donation that we're going to announce in August. So we're building that for them. Uh, and we're working through them because our real work is to raise the consciousness and to tell the stories that enable people to take this seriously. But they... And they're not getting the support that they need, not from the Lagos state government, which is doing a bit more than other governments. But again, not enough considering the population of Lagos state. Because I, I always often find that, that we take Lagos off the hook. But Lagos, they are not, there's not enough of a mental health infrastructure to deal with the 20 plus million people that we have in Lagos state. So I want to, I want to note the advancement in thinking Lagos State government, while acknowledging the paucity of efforts that can actually treat this problem. But Mentally Aware Foundation, she writes to man, who she just won the Queen's Young Leaders Award in Britain, are doing incredible work. And I really just want to ensure that everybody knows how much work they are doing and that there are more people who are able to access the help that they need. That's amazing, honestly. And what would you say you see for the future of mental health in Nigeria? Do you feel hopeful? Mm. I'm always hopeful. Hope is inexhaustible because the one thing we've learned about the human capacity is that we have the capacity to do anything we want to do. And sometimes change can be radical like this if the human beings involved come together to do that. So I am. If you ask me if I see the hope in the trends, no. But if I see the hope in the human capacity to wake up to its responsibility, then yes. All right. Mm -hmm. We know that you do a fantastic work with Joy Inc. Yeah. And from time to time you have the Joy Masterclass, yes. and you have the Daily Vulnerables. How yes. can people get more information? Yes, thank you for that. You thank you for that. So um, I do the Daily Vulnerable every day, and that's because I think that people have some form of respect for me, and they know people know my name. And so if a person like me, I think, I hope, confesses to weakness and failure and shame and all of those things, then people are more likely to have compassion on themselves. And so that's really what I do with the Daily Vulnerable every day. I share my own personal stories. Even to tell you that even the Joy Masters, sometimes, as they call me, experiences days of sadness, yeah? Because you can't learn to be happy if you don't know how to be sad, because sadness will come. So if you go to the dailyvulnerable.com and you sign up, you receive a newsletter, it's free every day, T-H-E, dailyvulnerable.com. That, uh, if you go to Joy Inc's website, joyinc.xyz, you get information about our master classes. Thankfully, I've gotten my friends, um, Banky W, um, Ubi Franklin, and uh, I think Toke Makinwa, They've agreed to do a free masterclass with me. Uh, we're trying yeah. to fix up the date. So in July, I think, we're going to be sitting down because they've spoken openly about past and present dealings with depression. So I want them to come out and let's talk about this. And I want to make that free. Um, and I want to take the masterclass across Nigeria, you know. Um, so if people want to work with us on that, that's fine. Uh, exactly. but, so you're open to having volunteers as well? Yes, yes, all absolutely. Right. All the help that we can get, all the help we can funnel to... Uh, mentally aware Nigeria and she writes woman, you know, this is a crisis that we can stop because depression, it can be cured through self-help, you know, and so it will be tragic. This is the one disease that we don't need huge resources to deal with. If you know do. what? Today, before we actually let you go, because we've quickly run out of time, right. in very few seconds, right. someone is watching you and the person is dealing with depression. Yes. What do you have to say to the person? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, first thing first is, what you're dealing with is real, it's real, it's, you, you are, it's not in your mind, and you deserve all the help that you get. But what you need to understand is that there's a reason why it's called subjective well-being. You can take control of your mind and redirect it. Now, how to do that is a bit complex, but um, um, if you go on YouTube, let me just say something quick. If you go on YouTube and you Google mental health, you'll find a lot of professionals. In 15 minutes, a lot of TED Talks that will teach you the first eight things you can do 
to make yourself better. If you go to my personal website, www.chudejidonwa.me, I have a YouTube playlist. And if you click on it, you can find, because I don't want to say one thing and then, but if you go, you will see all these 15 minutes free videos that you can just use to know what should I do when I'm facing a crisis. Okay. The first thing is not to panic, not to make it worse, and to find people who can empathize with you. If your mother doesn't empathize with you, if she tells you you are a lazy person, flee from her and find someone who can at least understand that what you're going through is very real. Thank you so Thank much. You. Very, Thank very happy put. We've had the presence of Chude Gideon, the founder of Joy Inc. And he's come to spread his joy, not just in our studio, but to you and to your TV screen. I feel refreshed after the conversation. Right? I'm glad so I do. <laughs> if you need to find out more information about this, you visit the website, thedailyvulnerables.com to find out more information as Chude is vulnerable with us every day so you can get his free newsletter and you can also follow him on instagram at chudeity or you visit his website www.chudejidionwood.me where you get to see a list of things videos you can watch to help yourself depression is real get help nobody is going to judge you and if you're around people that will judge you like today said please. Please. please thank you so much thank for joining you. us thank once again thank, so thank you so much to enjoy more of this our will get videos when you just watch press this button to subscribe on top of our youtube page you go love her